So, welcome to the Funky Brain Podcast, everybody. My name is Dennis Berry, and this is my Funky Brain. And I am so excited today. Uh, for some of you that may or may not know, I love coin collecting, and I've been in the coin business for about 15 years on and off, and um, more of a collector than on the business side, but I did have the business for a little while there. But um, in the world of coin collecting, Mr. Miles Standish is one of the uh, premier people out there, and I am so excited to have him on the show today. So, Mr. Miles Standish, how are you doing today? Thank you, Dennis. Appreciate being here. Awesome. Um, so tell us a little bit about yourself. What got you, how long have you been into coins and what got you into that and what got you to where you are today? I would love to hear that. Yeah, it's actually, it's over 40 years of uh, collecting different things, not just coins, um, but uh, it's been a lifelong passion. Uh, as I always say, I think, I believe people are born with the collecting gene of some sort. Yes. If they're truly a collector, yeah. um, I think mine took a different path than that where I've been able to be the custodian of everyone's collection. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's really you know, interesting. Yeah. You know, uh, both in my time, you know, working at PCGS for 29 years and, and I've been with NGC now for five years, but it's been a, it's been a great, uh, it's been a great ride in the sense of the fulfillment of the collecting interest or the, you know, the coin interest gets fulfilled, but, uh, you know, I've gotten to do so many other things around that, that, uh, it's kind of, it's always filled up my passion bucket. Yeah, that's really interesting. Thanks for sharing that. I know that when I was in the coin business and people would say, what do you do? And I would say, I'm a coin dealer. And I would say, and I'm sure you can agree with this, that well over 90% of the people that I said that to, they either said they were coin collectors or their grandfather was a coin collector or their uncle or their great aunt on their mother's side or somebody they knew was a coin collecting person. And they said, um, well, if you go back to over the years, and for those that don't know, it's called numismatics and it's the art of coin collecting. And um, it's called the hobby of kings. And so coin collecting goes back thousands of years. And it's so cool to build a life around it like you have. Yeah, I, you know, I feel very blessed that I found something that I would uh, maintain that passion throughout a lifetime for, and uh, probably just because I've been able to touch so many areas. It wasn't just, you know, for a long, long time, it was primarily just coin grading, and as, as, and as I grew with that, there were other things that I, I knew that, um, you know, I wanted to be able to develop and create, and also kind of give me a, a complete package of things that I've done. Uh, yeah, instead really of just cool. just instead of just one thing. Yeah, that's really cool. And so, one thing you mentioned for those that are tuning in, that um, you know, like I said, a lot of people say I'm a coin collector. And you know, if we go back, and when I talked with when Miles and I talked um, last week, we were talking about there's a lot of people they collect like wheat pennies, yeah. mercury dimes, the buffalo nickels, yeah. the state quarters. The state quarters were really important because they kind of rekindled coin sure. interest. And the mint made lots of money, billions of dollars off of that. Um, right. But when one thing you said when you were just talking there is about coin grading. So for those that are tuning in that don't know what coin grading is, that they just have like a, a box of pennies somewhere and they don't understand what you're talking about, maybe you can explain that a little bit. Well, uh, you know, like many collectibles, coins are, coins are no different than uh, diamonds or gemstones or or even automobiles. They have a level of condition and a, a standard of condition. Obviously with, with coin grading, um, it's um, somewhat closer to like diamond grading where you, you know, you have basically, you know, you have the surfaces, the strike, the eye appeal, the luster of uh, those are the different facets in determining a coin's grade. Um, kind of like with diamonds where there's, you know, inclusions and clarity and cut. But, um, you know, we basically uh, uh, go off the sh what's called the Sheldon scale from Dr. Sheldon, who created what was called the 70-point scale back in the 1940s. And, um, you know, with, with coin grading the last nearly 35 years, you know, where coins have been encapsulated 
instead of trading independently based on each individual dealer's grade, but um, an independent grading service grading them, you know, as a BNGC, where the coin is then sealed in a contained holder and maintaining that condition and that grade um, for exactly three years to come. Right. So for what what Miles is describing there is this this is called a coin holder. And uh, your coin, you can submit coins for grading, and they get encapsulated in this holder, what he was just talking about. Oh, he has one right there, of course. So, um, and, they, they, and they come in jumbo, too. Uh, yes, and actually, I have a couple of those of the 2010 America the Beautiful quarters when they first came out. So what is that one? Well, you know, this actually, I got a, better, I got a good story to tell about this, but this is obviously the... 50th anniversary commemorative coin from Apollo 11, the first moonwalk. Nice. And last year in 2019 was the 50th anniversary. Something that, you know, I expanded and developed in our industry was uh, coins and autographs, authentic hand signed autographs and genuine coins combined together in the packaging. And you'll see that this coin is signed by uh, Charlie Duke, who was on Apollo 16 and uh, you know, obviously with the uh, coronavirus 19 going around, um, uh, Charlie is a neighbor to me, um, doesn't live too far from me. And uh, I've had the opportunity to spend a lot of time with him. Um, you know, it's, it's been interesting because, you know, we've talked more about the world. We've talked about life and, uh, and, you know, I try to uh, cover those things instead of being the, being the obvious questions about, his moonwalking time. Um, but he's obviously he shared interesting stories about that. But, uh, you know, I spoke with him yesterday because Charlie's in his um, early eighties now. And, uh, you know, I just reached out to him to make sure that him and his wife had plenty and they didn't have to go out and, you know, just trying to be of service, reaching out to him and, uh, making sure that if they needed anything, I would make the run for them, but, uh, they're in good shape and doing well, uh, down in, uh, just outside of Austin, Texas. Awesome. Yeah. And for those, in case somebody's watching this later on outside of when we're recording this, this is during the COVID virus. So that's cool that you were doing that and reaching out. We're all doing our part to um, help those in need, those that are at higher risk. But I think that this podcast, when I reached out to Miles last week, he's like, yeah, that would be a good diversion from the, the craziness that's going on in the world right now. So I'm so excited that you got here. So th what you were talking about, they, these are all, and that's a really cool coin that you have. Thanks for sharing. When we're talking about grading services, these coin encapsulations, these, these holders, there's um, really the big four that we always call them. There was the PCGS, NGC, this is PCGS, NGC, and this is uh, Annex and ICG. And really, it's like the big two if you're keeping things straight here but um the ngc holders here so when when you were talking about those you said you there's a lot that goes into coin grading there's the strike the relief the the wear and tear on the coin maybe you can describe a little bit more about that yeah well you know basically those are the elements that come involved when determining the the grade of the coin obviously depending on the coin um you know authenticity is is a valuable part of the services that we provide for everything we certify, you know, obviously with the, the expansion of counterfeits in the world, you know, uh, it doesn't matter what it is. It has to be looked at first to be authentic. You know, after that, uh, you know, uh, you know, each individual grader that looks at a coin, uh, you know, determines the, uh, the grade in their opinion um, before that coin is encapsulated and finalized and shipped back to customers. But, you know, depending on what it is, um, it's, there's, you know, the factors that are involved are, you know, you know, obviously the surface condition, the strike, the eye appeal, the luster, um, all taken into account um, are the many factors. Right. Yeah. And that's cool. And, you know, when people like, I, like you, I used to buy a lot of coin collections. And, you know, like grandpa dies and they find a collection up in the attic. And so they call you up and they're like, they find these coins and they're like so excited because they're like, oh, we just made a million dollars. So they go out and start buying cars and stuff. And then I'll look at their coin collection. I'm like, well, 
this might be worth like $50. And you can see their face get flushed and they're all like, oh my God, what are you talking about? And I've also been on the other side of that where I'll go and look at coin collection and be like, oh, well, I'll give you $200 for this and then I'll take it home and I'll find out that there were coins in there worth thousands of dollars. And what I'm looking at, and I came to learn how to determine coins values. A lot of it early on was based on making mistakes, <laughs> right? So I would send coins in for grading into NGC or PCGS or some of these other coin companies and they wouldn't come back. I would pay a hundred dollars for a coin and it would come back where it's worth like, you know, $2. So I've learned how to not make those mistakes anymore. But what I do and a lot of people do is you look at a price guide somewhere online and they're like, well, this coin is worth $10,000. If you can only find somebody to give you $500 for it, it's only worth $500. So coin so, well, the, the key, the key word there is you called it a price guide guide. Yes. And people forget that word always. Yes. Well, and then, so to go into what you were talking about, so coins values are based on rarity and condition. So, and, and demand. And demand. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, and a lot of times, like, we'll look into, and I meant to grab a red book, but that, again, like you said, that's really great. Guide. It's a guide. It says, okay, well, this one has a, a original population of maybe 2 million, but who knows how many are, are remain in existence throughout the, all the different market changes over the years. People sure. a lot of those coins. So how do we really know how many are out there, right? Well, you know, the beautiful thing, um, you know, in the mid-80s when the, the censuses and population reports were created, you know, it's obviously, you know, there's lots of things that have been determined since then. But in the beginning, you know, things that we interpreted, some things we interpreted as, as scarce became common and vice versa. But that that knowledge that was gained off those censuses of things that the grading services graded, uh, you know, has been quite helpful. Now you would think after 35 years, not that there aren't things that still get turned up, you know, with uniqueness or low mintage or, you know, vast value that, uh, you know, as I call the treasure find, you know, but we've gotten a pretty good idea of what's really still left and that hasn't been destroyed. Yeah, that's great. Another thing I would love to hear your opinion on is what people talk about, and it's a word that's kind of thrown around a lot, is called rare. So rare coins. Because, you know, with uh, eBay out there, everybody says rare, rare. This is a very rare coin. This is a very rare coin. So rare really means, that, to my understanding, and you can correct me, is that there are very few in existence. In some cases, like less than 10, right? Well, you have to understand that, uh, you know, there's uh, a certain amount of population that the mint grade, or excuse me, that the mints around the world and the United States strike. You know, it's, it's based on survival rates. And, of course, something might be readily common, but it might be highly desirable and still have a value based on it because the desire, even though the mintages or the availabilities might be high, People like to own them. Yeah. You know, um, there's a great demand for a $20 St. Gaudens $20 gold piece. You know, and if you take a common date in 63 or 64, you know, you have uh, just shy of an ounce of gold in there, which creates the demand for the item. Uh, the beauty of the strike and the, um, you know, I don't want to say thinness of supply, but you know, a lot of those minages have been hard to be determined because so many were melted down and destroyed in 1933. And a lot of them ended up in Europe that uh, have been coming back for, you know, since gold was legalized, they've been coming back to this country. Uh, well, I never so knew that story about them going over to Europe. How did that happen? I believe that the government used it for um, possibly, you know, either debts, or some type of financial agreement with different countries. But there are, you know, there are central banks all over Europe that uh, some, and South America around the globe that are potentially treasure troves for coins. But if you think about it, you know, the, the, the European, the, you know, to me, the European ones are the most fantastic because of 
the history behind it. If you think about if they went over there in late 1933, you know, they went through World War II there. They were saved and protected against Nazi Germany. Yeah. Um, I have a feeling that uh, the stories are vast, how they potentially moved them around to protect them from being stolen. Um, I, I, I can say this because I witnessed some of the deposits of where they are. And uh, to me, that is the, uh, you know, to me, it's one of those holy grail of treasure stories of, you know, how they were protected and preserved um, during that era of time. Yeah, that's really cool. So to flip the script a little bit, since we got on this topic of gold and silver, and we are in such a turbulent time right now, a lot of people thought, that when a situation like this came up with the COVID virus and the stock market crashing, that gold and silver would have just shot through the roof. And as those that are following along with the market are seeing, that is not the case at all. Yeah, but I think the reason, I think that there has been a, a, a large amount of selling for either people that are leveraged that needed their gold to pay off their expenses on the leverage. So I think that that has been, in, and that is, this is learning on the curve. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you that, Dennis, that's the best knowledge I have at this hour. You know, we're late into March here, so that's the answer I have today for you. And if I ever change my opinion on that, I'll know. I initially thought the same thing that most people would think. You know, if you watch all the metals, which I primarily do, and people will say, well, what are all the metals? I watch silver, gold, platinum, uh, palladium, and rhodium, and most, so there's a lot, lot to watch there. And, uh, and I'll just tell you that, you know, the current bid today is $2,000 an ounce for rhodium. And when this all started, rhodium was 11,500. Somebody got hit real hard, yeah, you know, or some people did. You well, know, it's I not a pop- it, I'm sorry, go ahead. Me? It's not a popular, it's, and I'm just talking about this metal just to, just to have a nice, you know, I don't know, but I don't know many people that'll talk to you about it, but, um, uh, it's kind of interesting to think that, you know, it's not a metal that the general population knows about, nor do they have. You know, most people have a little, maybe a little bit of gold, maybe a little bit of silver, maybe a touch of platinum, um, and then of course, uh, palladium. But, um, uh, you know, rhodium's quite a story in this. It's, you know, it's like a a blue chip stock that, you know, the last five years has gone up uh, tremendously and then, you know, it's kind of like the floor was taken out of it. But, um, but yeah, no, I mean, silver's had a bottom of about um, $12 during this period. Um, I know before I went to bed last night, it was about 13 and a half bucks. Um, and uh, it was about... It was up about 80 cents today, I think. Yeah, it was, it was mid-range 17 and a half dollars or more, kind of when all this began, began and, and then collapsed to $12. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, but I, I, I think potentially, you know, there was some heavy, there was some heavy trades going on based on need for paying off margin calls and debts. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I remember, um, it was around the time when gold around the 2009 time and, uh, platinum was up around $10,000. No, no, pl- platinum's height, pa- platinum's height, I believe is 23 or 2400. Was that? I, I forget. Something was up really high. But anyway, so that's interesting, though. But uh, the one thing I wanted to say, like, there used to be rules, right? It's like when you think you know the rules, the rules change. And it used to be, like, when, back when the gold standard was introduced in the early 1900s, it was at a ratio of 16 to 1. And right. Which, of course, that doesn't – by those ratios alone, silver should be up around $100 an ounce. But why is it? Why isn't it? And my theory is that it's still, well, there's a bunch. One thing is it's still kind of considered more of a commercial metal. And it's, uh, but it's still strange though, because there one, there is a finite amount of silver. We have most of it above ground that we have access to. There's some like in the earth's core and stuff that we don't yet have access to, but for the most part, we have it. And why isn't it trading for more? What are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, when you said uh, the turn of the century, you know, obviously I thought of, uh, you know, the expansion and capabilities of mining has gotten so much easier from that point. Um, You know, I I can't tell you that I know how much is left in the earth. My first guess would have been if somebody asked me that 
point blank, I would have said, you know, there's plenty. <laughs> I don't know what that <laughs> means. Definitely uh, could be some of the cause, but obviously that ratio has changed dramatically. You know, I can tell you this, that, you know, most of my early years in coin collecting, you know, platinum was always more like $100 an ounce more than gold standard. That was just, that was, if you go through the middle 80s, early 1980s, you know, if gold was 300, platinum was 400. Yeah. And, uh, you know, today, you know, you have $1,600 gold, as we're speaking right now, $1,600 gold. And the bottom of platinum during this market was about, I think it was 598 or 600 bucks. Mm -hmm. And to think of it as a thousand dollars less seems to be the big giveaway to me. But, okay. you know. Yeah, that's interesting. And I think um, what's going to happen, I, I, this is one of my theories that I want to share. And I've not shared this on a podcast or publicly, but I talk about it in my conversations is that at some point, like when you take the, the value of gold and silver, gold is gold. Nothing's ever going to be gold. There's something sure. about holding gold. It's like worshipped in India and China. It's like religion. And there's nothing that's really going to ever replace that, I don't think, in my mind. And as of right now, like I always tell people to invest in silver. Buy silver, buy silver, dig a hole in the backyard, make a treasure map, like, like buy silver. Because the idea of making an investment is that you want to make best use of those funds and you want to have the best performance. And so... Sure. Gold right now is $1,600. Let's just say at some point this crazy stuff happens and it goes up to $5,000 an ounce. That's a 300% increase. If you mm -hmm. look at silver, that's $15, $14 an ounce, whatever it is, and it goes up to $75, that's a 500% increase. Mm -hmm. Is that going to happen? Absolutely, at some point. And then when I say, all right, but if it's based on demand, let's just say for right now, gold is still an affordable investment for the middle to upper class man. We can go out, or and woman, we can go out and buy an ounce of gold. And it's mm -hmm. still somewhat affordable for, you know, $1,500 dollars $2,000. We can go out and buy gold. So what's going to happen is, and this is one of my little theories here, as gold starts to rise and go to wherever it may go, it will no longer be an affordable investment. And so people are going to turn to silver. And that's where that supply and demand factor is going to come in. And I think that's one of the factors besides the banks controlling the actual value of the silver. I think that that's going to be the supply and demand factor that drives silver up. Well, you know what's going on right now? Um, right now we're in the coronavirus, <clears throat> which is an unusual time, but the supplies, supplies for silver are depleted. Mm -hmm. You know, the premiums over spot for silver, you know, are very high at this hour. Um, as much as to buy, you know, a Silver Eagle, you know, at $10 over spot, which is... Is it um, really? I didn't look yeah, into it. That, that, that's been the highest number that I've seen from a major retailer. Wow. Um, when that was a coin that you could have bought prior to this at, you know, $2 and a quarter, $2 and 50 cents. Yeah. You know, when you say $2, remember the mint sells them at $2. Yeah. So there's... You know, there's something going on there too, but, um, you know, you can buy them by the box load. You can buy boxes of Silver Eagles, 500 count boxes at, you know, 215 to 225 a coin over spot. And, um, and there's a shortage. Now, of course, obviously, you know, I'm a big fan of Silver Eagles. Do you realize how many Silver Eagles have been made since 1986? It's a finite amount. I know that. They started increasing it. Uh, what was it after 2010? I forgot. It, well, they, they, they obviously had an issue with getting planchets. And if they, if they can't get enough planchets to make the coins, they, they didn't make proofs in 2000, 2009. And um, they um, only made the uncirculated coins. But, there's, but of all the minages, and they, you have to think about it, none of them have been destroyed. Right. None of them have been spent. I mean, we're talking basically they're not commerce type of coins because they're an ounce of silver. They may have a dollar denomination on them, but think about them. They're all preserved kind of like how they were made from the mint. They're not spent. They haven't been lost at the bottom of a shipwreck, but they've made over a half a billion coins. Wow. And it's the number one collected coin other than a Lincoln cent, which is a penny, obviously, and it's, I would say that a vast majority of people that collect Lincoln cents are not coin collectors. 
they just throw them in a bucket, throw them in a bucket. But of a, of a uh, intrinsic valued coin, the Silver Eagle is the, far, the farthest most collected silver coin in the history of man. Right. Yeah, that's kind of crazy. And I think some of that, and this might be a good time to talk about your, the book that you wrote. You wrote a book about the Silver Eagle. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I'll give you a copy here, show you. Does that look good there? Yeah, that looks great. Yeah, tell us a little about it. Well, this is a, uh, this is a book that I did in, uh, started doing in 2011. Uh, and I'll put that down. But um, I wrote that book with uh, John Mercanti, who was uh, basically, as you can see, the, uh, he was the designer of this heraldic eagle on the back of the coin. And John was the chief engraver of the U.S. Mint. He obviously did the modifications for, as, as we call it, the Walking Liberty half dollar size or design that was put in a full dollar size coin of one ounce of fine silver. But uh, so I did this book with John and um, uh, actually the forward on that book uh, in the first four editions has been Michael Reagan. And of course, a lot of people wonder, why'd you use Michael Reagan? Well, the, the, uh, the Gold Eagle Act or the Silver Eagle Act of uh, uh, 1985 was signed by Ronald Reagan, and that's why these coins were ever made. So he's been, he's, you know, Reagan is tied to these coins as long as they're manufactured. So I, I, I asked Michael to write the forward for this book, uh, and uh, we've become friends for a long, long time now. And uh, like I said, we're in about the fourth edition now, and um, it is uh, of an individual coin series. I don't know, other than the Red Book, has there ever been a better selling book? Right. I don't think so. That, it's really interesting about, for those that are listening, I do not know what the American Silver Eagle is. So every country has their version of a bullion coin, and ours is the one ounce. It's one ounce of 999 fine silver. Mm-hmm. And um, it's called a silver eagle, and there's also a gold eagle, a gold counterpoint. And right, the hundred dollar, the hundred dollar, excuse me, the fifty dollar gold eagle. Yeah, the fifty dollars. So the silver eagle actually has a one dollar value. And people ask me all the time; they're like, How, "I want to buy some silver. How should I do it?" And I say, "Well, you could buy bars or rounds. There's all different ways that you can buy silver, and you could buy, you know, anything from they have uh, fractional silver now, like." half ounce small they have small coins which doesn't really make a lot of sense now but someday that might make sense but um it, this is a one ounce uh and for every coin that's produced produced by the mint every year they also make a proof counterpoint so maybe you could talk about proofs for a second this is a proof silver eagle as you can right. see that deep mirror background and that why don't you bring it a little closer yeah here we go yeah, that's fantastic. As you can see, the highly reflective mirror finish on that coin. This is struck a little differently than the counterpart. It's uncirculated coin, where you can see the mirror finish effect that you can see uh, probably Dennis's camera or computer in front of him. But uh, that coin is struck on a highly polished planchet with special dyes. They're highly polished and prepared to create that frosty device on Miss Liberty and, of course, the eagle on the back, but also obtain that high mirror finish. And, uh, you know, proofs were originally made, uh, you know, based on the, uh, the beauty enhanced by the proof condition to attract collectors to collect them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and early on, the original coin, where it came from, correct me if I'm wrong, but early on, they didn't use that. Well, one, they didn't have the technology and the resources available that we have nowadays. But early on, they would strike coins on planchets that were just normal planchets. And then they would produce this with their early dyes. So the very first few that were minted or were struck actually produced a finish like this. So that's why coins from decades and decades ago that have that um, proof-like, right? We call it a proof-like background. Mm-hmm. What would happen was the early ones that were struck using that die would produce this effect. And then as the more coins that it struck, then it didn't have that effect anymore. So those aren't, mm-hmm. nowadays, those aren't as collectible. But now right. we have technology, so they only strike so many coins and then they get rid of that die or sell it on eBay or something, and something like that, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, 
there's just a, you know, there's a different manufacturing um, uh, difference between uncirculated coins and proof coins. Um, I, you know, I always tell people, you know, uh, buy what you like. I don't have a suggestion of which one over the other. It's nice. Um, and, you know, my book details every single coin of variety and style. Um, and, I, and I'll talk about that word style in a second. But it talks about every, every, every date and mint that each coin was made at the U.S. Mint for the entire Silver Eagle program. You know, both um, and the details are, you know, you've got uncirculated coins, you've got burnished coins, you've got enhanced coins, you've got reverse proofs, and you've got... Yeah, they proofs. came out with so many different versions once this started getting popular. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, one uh, thing I always say, and you, you can piggyback on this, but like when people ask me, and I kind of brought this up before, how should I buy my coins or my silver? And I say to people, um, well, what you just said, one, buy what you like. Like when I started coin collecting and some, I got my first Morgan dollar. Well, my first ones were when I was in high school and they, you could still get them at the bank and I traded it in for beer money at some point. But anyway, that's another story. But the, uh, when I first started getting my Morgan silver dollars, I was like, oh my God. Like I was so mesmerized by it. And I was like, I want everybody to see this. This is 130 years old. I wonder where it's been. And, right. And it's so exciting. Now, if you feel that way about some kind of coin, then you should stick with that. And if you don't know about coins or um, you're not sure how to like grade a coin or value a coin, I say buy Silver Eagles because otherwise you can get taken advantage of. There's a lot of unscrupulous people in our coin world, and sure. which is one of the reasons that this exists is to help authenticate your investment. Exactly. Well, you know what the uh, the assurance is, is that it's been independently looked at, not by the person that you're buying it from, yes, but a, but a third party um, that is paid to do that job, that the dealer has paid for them to do that. And uh, it gives assurances to the public when they're buying something um, that they're getting what they paid for. You know, price is a matter of you know, your shopping, your shopping knowledge, you know, to check the whole market to where you get a price where you're happy and build a relationship maybe with somebody that you want to do business with going forward. But, you know, up until 19, roughly 1995 or 96, you know, when the internet got turned on for everybody, you know, it's created a real global activity that is put, I don't know what the, the, I can't tell you, you know, how many more people it's brought to the market, but literally, uh, it's just brought so many new people into collecting, buying gold and silver, buying certified coins, building sets of coins. Um, it's just got that many more eyeballs on it than just the attendance that, you know, shows up at a coin shop or at a coin show. Yeah. Oh, and that's an interesting too. The, like you could buy whole collections now. It used to be, and this is why when you buy like old collections, like of these old timers that used to collect coins. And so when you collect a denomination of coin, and I always say, find one that you like and stick with it. Like I wanted to get every coin from every type of coin that there was. But when you, when you talk about a, um, a denomination of coin, penny, nickel, dime, quarter, half dollar, whatever it is, I say you can always go out and get almost all of them affordably. Mm -hmm. A lot of them, if you're talking about like the change pennies, nickels, dimes, quarters, you can go to the bank and get a lot of those. And, but there's always those holes and those holes, those are called key dates. And then those get more expensive. So like when you take the Morgan silver dollar, for example, this was the Morgan silver dollar here. For those that do not know, this is an 1896. Oh, which some consider to kind of be like a semi key date because they made a little less or at least a nicer condition. That's what exists. But um, those are harder to find and more expensive, especially in really nice condition. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so key dates. And what you said was interesting about the um, the internet driving interest in coin collecting because you can go mm -hmm. out and get them now. And what's happening is that you can get somebody come along with millions of dollars that at their disposal and they'll just buy a collection of Morgan silver dollars in really nice condition for like, $10 million, but mm -hmm. you, you didn't used to be able to do that. Now with eBay. No, it was, it was a treasure. It used to be a treasure hunt. 
Yeah. But the encapsulation and grading of coins, uh, the way the internet works with, um, you know, the, the different avenues to create a registry of your set, um, you know, communicates to the whole world. Some people who share that, share that information of what they have. Yeah. So it makes it a little easier if somebody's after something to maybe communicate with somebody, you know, that has what they want. Yeah. And the other thing, which I was going to bring up because we've been talking about silver eagles, but then you write a, did you do a Morgan book too? Yeah, I did. So now Morgan silver dollars is considered by many to be the most beautiful coin. In my opinion, it's the, it was, it was the cornerstone of my beginning collecting. Yes. And this is the Morgan silver dollar. Mm -hmm. Very popular. I, and, and you know, before 1986, you couldn't have told me and it's really significant. And I'm, and I'm, I'm actually, it's, you know, I don't have any self-interest in Silver Eagles other than, uh, you know, obviously my book, but I've written a book on both Morgans and Silver Eagles. But I, you couldn't have told me prior to 1986 that someday that the Silver Eagle would eclipse the popularity and the collectability globally of Morgan dollars. That's how, that's how entrenched, you think about it, it was a coin that hadn't been made since 1921 all the way up till you know, 1986, it was the world's most recognized coin in silver. And it's amazing what the Silver Eagle did to that coin. And like I said, that, you know, my, my book is the Morgan Dollar Love Affair. <laughs> and because I love Morgans. I do. You know, so, you know, you just couldn't, you, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't have convinced me that. Now, at about the 10 year part, I started thinking about doing the book um, that was still, really 20 more years to go in building of its set, but uh, actually 24 years, um, not 30 years, excuse me. But the, um, the idea of, of doing a book, you, you, know, you needed some completion targets for people, you know, to be able to assemble a book and create the idea of collecting a set. And uh, so it wasn't until 2011 that, uh, you know, the Silver Eagle book came out. Yeah, well, a lot, if you talk to a lot of old timers, they won't, they don't consider the Silver Eagle even a collectible coin. They just think of it as a bullion coin, which, I, which technically it's, I don't know. I mean, like, what's your opinion on it? Well, you know, you're an old timer. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess when you said that, it really, it really said something to me because I've heard it before, obviously, a thousand times. So the Morgan dollar market really, really, really didn't get developed till the mid to late 1970s, mm -hmm. where they separated them by uncirculated coins and kind of separated them by grade, proof likes, deep mirror proof likes. That didn't happen till the late 70s. So what did, in, let's say 1965, when bus dollars and barber halves and Mercury dimes or more tight coins, more gold old coins were, were, the, were the height of the market. Don't you think a coin dealer in 1965 said, oh, those Morgan dollars, they're junk? <laughs> Yo, totally, yeah. Yeah, you so, can get them at the bank. I, I think that the, the value for the Silver Eagle is going to be the same thing. It's going to be like in 50 years from now, if you have the uh, 1986 first year of mintage Silver Eagle, we're all going to be gone at that point and they'll, they'll have a value. And it might be, and if you think about it, you know, in the 1960s, you could go to the treasury department and buy uh, bags of Morgan dollars for, for face value or a small premium even. And I know people that did that and they were, they weren't considered great rarities, right? They weren't even selling at a premium. So that's the early 19 to mid 1960s. And then the market isn't developed for another 20 years later or excuse me, uh, 10 years later, it still took a real 10 years to even get, you know, some kind of appreciation, sure. real appreciation. So to me, it's like, okay, so Silver Eagle started in 1986, flash forward to 2020, you know, there's going to be a period of time out there that somebody's going to say, God, I got to get that first year of issue and I got to build that whole set. Mm -hmm because of diminished supply because every year the silver eagle was made those back years get tougher and tougher to get yeah yeah and then also is it what's the 1996 is that considered the key date so far of you're the, talking about the well yeah uh the 96 uncirculated coin yes 
Yeah, so those actually have a little value because they were less mintage. But you know, I, and we could talk about, I love Morgans too. My opinion on the best coin investments to make right now is that I still think, even though now everybody knows about the Morgan and it's popular and it's, it's all this stuff, don't you agree that it's still the most undervalued coin? Like, how is it that you can still buy a Morgan silver dollar from 1878, the first year that it was struck, for like $30? Even a crappy one. Like, yeah. even a, you can buy an AU or even an UNC for like less than for, for $40. Well, like, think about an uncirculated, how about an uncirculated, the most common date that comes the most beautiful, 1881S. Yes. And say MS 66 condition. Mm -hmm. You know, we're talking a few hundred dollars. A few hundred dollars. I think that that's insane. So I think that the best investment, and I tell this to people too, is to buy uncirculated Morgans. And I still, because when you look at those population reports, you go into the Red Book or wherever you are, those population reports are how many were struck 120 years ago. Mm -hmm. They don't have any real value right now because as, over the years as silver has gone up and down people melted anything that wasn't uncirculated and even probably some of the uncirculated which they did in 1921 to make peace dollars so they right. probably there those population reports are way off and so how come you can still buy even common dates like really nice coins for like 60 dollars it doesn't make any sense so, well, the other, the, sometimes the other thing that's happened in society is, you know, the rage of coin collecting was in the 50s and 60s. They called that the rage. Obviously, the collector base is even larger today than it was then. Sure. But, you know, I don't know if it's because of all the distractions we have, of all the options of, uh, uh, you know, I call them pleasantries of keeping our minds filled with whatever we're doing next with either either ourselves or family you know, there's a lot more to do than there is you know a lot more to do in in 2020 not necessarily this week um <laughs> but there's a lot more to do in life in 2020 than say there was in uh, 1950. interesting so you're saying that's taking away from some of the value that it would otherwise. you have. know what i, I I'm, I'm i'm putting it out there but uh you know maybe it's caused from that yeah I, um, but i think at some point those values of of Morgan silver dollars really in any condition because that what's going to happen next is that silver does go up. The same thing's going to happen. Anything that's mm -hmm. not at least an AU, they're going to melt. And then the population goes down even more. So making even any type of good looking Morgan silver dollar is going to be the value at some point is going to skyrocket. So yeah. that's my opinion. I think any, yeah, I don't know. any type of nice Morgan dollar is really the great, a great investment to make. You know, that's why I always tell people, uh, you know, I don't give investment advice. I always say, buy what you like. Yes. Buy what makes you happy. When you hold it, and it, do you get excited? Like, I used to get that way a lot more than I do with the coins, unless I see, like what we talked about last week, if I see a nice, frosty, barber half dollar, that is exciting to me. I think. Well, you know, you know, you know I showed you the, uh, the, uh, the five ounce, the five ounce 50th anniversary of Apollo 11. Now, if you told me that the mint would be making beveled coins that where it's kind of like a dish, yeah, <laughs> right. in five ounce size. Now, if you told me that in 1984, you know, I'd probably been a good listener, but I wouldn't have believed it, right? And that yeah. we'd be encapsulating them like this, you know, independently, each one of them like this. You know, it's pretty phenomenal where we've yeah. come, where yeah. we were. How many of those did they make? I'm just curious. Uh, I want to say it was eighty thousand, but you know, you're, yeah, it's just something in the it's in the details to be able to look it up what they stopped at. Right. Um, it wasn't as many as I thought, maybe, and that mintage might be high. I can get back to you on that. Mm. No, that's cool. Yeah, and I I think like we talked about just earlier is that all these coins that are being created right now the real value isn't going to come for decades from now like the real high value unless something happens like an error or something like that um mm -hmm. but other and, than the, that, and the mint still produces those that still happens you know occasionally sure you know 
Um, yeah, and it used to be years ago also that they they only made there were a lot less people half the population that there is now, and they only made a, you know a few million, twenty million, or whatever coins, and now they make billion how many quarters like two billion quarters a year now. Yeah, with right. with no intrinsic value. Exactly. Yeah. So there's no silver. They're just like uh, what's it called? Uh, what's the material? It's just I. I I always refer to it as pot metal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much it's cl it's clad co it's clad coinage. Yeah, clad. Yeah, so it's just a mixture of really of metal that really has no value. And other countries were doing it for years, and then what was it? Nineteen sixty four. They took all those silver right. value out. Yeah, exactly. And they're even taking the copper out of pennies now, so the pennies aren't even worth it. Yeah, that's that started in nineteen eighty two, where they just did a fine layer of of copper and it's a zinc alloy on the inside. Yeah. Well, this has been great miles. I appreciate you taking the time to come. I think this was such a great discussion. It was a real honor for me. That was great. It's nice. Great way to meet. Um, I know we just had a few brief moments to speak last week and uh, I look forward to it. it. Like I said, it offered a great distraction on planning and uh, you know, just added to my day between phone calls uh, with people that I work with. Um, but it was lovely and I appreciate it. Yeah, I really do too. It was fun to talk shop with somebody of your caliber in the coin world. And uh, anytime you want to speak, I, I'm, I'm glad to talk about uh, marketing, collectibles, numismatics, uh, you name it. Oh, awesome. Yes. Well, how about sometime soon we're going to hop on another call and talk about marketing? How's that? That'd be great. I look forward to it. Maybe a couple of weeks. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much, Miles. I appreciate your time. And, yeah. um, Again, Miles Standish with Numismatic Guarantee Corporation. A real honor and privilege. Thanks, Miles. Nice meeting you, Dennis. Stay safe. Nice out. being on the show. Yeah, awesome. I appreciate it. All right now.